Amen. You may be seated, and we will start with a message. The high priest of God. What is the high priest? What is the high priest? What was he to do in the Old Testament? And I'm going to not get into so many details about what the high priest all did, but then we'll turn the message to what is really laying on my heart. So if you can follow with me, uh, the purpose of the high priest basically comes and originates from the lineage of Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest that we, are, that we know about, and he was set as a high priest after God made a very clear um, indication that he wants to live with mankind. He said, I want to live with man. I want to come down and, and allow myself to be at home with them. And then he asked them to build a tabernacle and to bone that request of building the tabernacle on Mount Sinai. The instruction was given of the do's and don'ts, the laws, 10 different laws, was given. There were a lot of laws before that, but then on Sinai, he narrowed it down to 10 through the tablets of stone that he told Moses. Now, when he came down and he said, I want a house or I want a home myself with my people, immediately there was a high priest put in place. And the high priest's name was Aaron. And we want to follow somewhat the lineage of Aaron as the high priest and go from all the way back to where it started to all the way where it is today. Now, we're not going to name so many of those names. We understand very clearly that those high priests, a lot of times, and most of them, were men of many faults. They had a lot of faults. And it was not that they so qualified, not all of them, that they so qualified because of their perfection or personal perfection in God but it was the lineage where they were birthed in is what qualified them in part, what made them a high priest. And this goes all the way down into the house of Cephas at the very end, in which we have seen that house. In fact, I think we, no, we can't. It's a little bit to the left of that video picture here on the, on the wall is where Cephas' house is. That's where Jesus was judged at the end. Now, so what were the high priests called to do? This is basically what happened, that God saw it important that man, after he said that I want to come and dwell with you and I want to build, and I ask you to build a tabernacle and I will walk with you and I want to be with my people. It was after that that he said, we need a high priest and the high priest was to do specific duties. One of those duties that a high priest did was simply that once a year he would take the sins that were confessed to him throughout the year of the people and his own sins. He would take it in behind the veil and there he offered it before God by way of incense and blood. This is what he did, but he only was allowed to go in there once a year. It was such a holy place. You see, God is a God of holiness and down through the old ages of the Old Testament, we never really found a way that God in His powerful holiness could deal with the conditions of man's sin. Man was far too sinful to come in the presence of God. So he chose the highest office that man can carry, known as a high priest, to deliver the sin that was in the children of Israel, and of himself, and he took him into behind that veil once a year alone. And somehow God could stand that because they were, it was brought with blood. It was, the sins were brought with blood, but they were also brought on the shoulders of the high priest, which we'll get into some of those details in a bit. So Moses went to meet God at Sinai, and it was after that he came down that there was the tablets of stone. And we want to talk a little bit about the stones now that God told him that he needs to carry upon Aaron's apron or ephod. And he carried the stones that all had little signatures of the children of Israel. There was a total of six rows. I mean, if it was, it was a total of 12, it would have been six on the top and six on the bottom, four in line. 
And on each was, was a word or a name of one of the children of Israel. Now, according to some of the other readings that I have read, just on the, uh, the teachings of the uh, old Jewish tradition, uh, it's, it's said on there that there are some other things that were written perhaps on the very top. This is according to the Talmud, which is the traditional teachings of the rabbis. So what we have here is, is that this is what they say. The Bible doesn't necessarily say that. This is what they say, that the highest from uh, Moses and those names were written in specifics right on top of, of some of those stones. Now, whether that's true or not, we don't know. And I don't know, I, I just felt it important perhaps to mention a little bit. But now we skip down a little bit. And after that Moses, some reason we have an echo in here. And I don't know if, I think they're working on it, but it's working in my mind a little bit. Is it working in yours? <laughs> so, um, Exodus chapter 25, starting in verse 6. Now, I explained a little bit before what happens before verse 6. But now we go to verse 6, and this is where it starts. It says, oil for light. And this is what the high priest was to have. Oil for light, spices for anointing oil, and for a sweet incense. Now in verse 7 it says, the next verse, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. Verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, God said like this, I will dwell with the people in the holy of holies, behind the veil. This is where I will place myself and I will rest myself in that position. But when you come into my presence by one man, once a year, I want you to be dressed with this, with a name written on the stones of, that represent all of the children of Israel, all right, the, the people that he's dwelling with. And I want you to use and write them on onyx stones. Now, onyx stones, when you look at, um, just in the, and Google it up or, or something of that nature, uh, if you look at the word onyx and, and what it means and, and to what it is described as is perhaps one of the most beautiful stones that you will find. I, with my personal opinion, would say it's probably one of the prettiest stones I have ever seen. Even more so than gold to me. Gold is precious, yes, but an onyx stone is very, very special. And it has a lot of detail that only has been put in there that you cannot really manipulate any way, shape, or form. Now, there's different colors of onyx stones. There's a black onyx stones. And in fact, how many of you have seen this? And I might just put out a little warning thing. Some people that uh, go to massage places to get a massage and so forth, no problem with that. But then they put these black stones, those are onyx stones, they put them on the back because they say there's something in an onyx stone that brings healing to a person. Now, when you look at the onyx stone and the world description of it, they take this off of here thinking that in these onyx stones is a special power to heal. This is not why God put them on here as a special power to heal. It is simply a piece of mineral. There's no strength in it, all right? So that's not the point. Even though from the world perspective, they think that way. But what God saw was the names of his people that he dwells with in a face-to-face -face situation behind the veil once a year with a high priest with blood, a little container with blood, and he had some other spices that he offered, some incense that he offered. But with that was the names, and this is how God looked at those people that he dwelt with. He did not necessarily look at these people as really evil, corrupt people, or he would have put them in the worst stones you can find. He looked at them obviously as being very precious, and he, so he put the names in these very precious stones, in these very beautiful stones. In fact, the beautif most beautiful stones that you can about get. He put the names of the children of Israel on those so that it, it didn't diminish on what he thinks of them. I, I want you to bear that in your mind as we go through this message that God did not write the names of the children of Israel, even though as failing as they were, into the worst and the ugliest stones he could find, based on typical religion today that we would think it would be done. 
But he used the most precious and most beautiful stone to write the names of them in because he thought so highly of what he wanted to do with them. So keep that in mind. They were actually known as stones of judgment. I will not go into the details of that, but we'll go to Exodus chapter 28, starting in verse 9. And thou shalt take two onyx stones, engrave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. All right? And then, you Google it up, you'll find what they believe is traditional, would have how it looked like in the old Hebrew language or whatever language it was taken. And then if you look at verse 29, And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. When he goes in unto the holy place for memorial before the Lord continually. Verse 30, And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and Tumen, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. I will stop there for a moment and go back and explain a little bit out of these verses now. Let's look at this. Let's take a picture of this. Aaron, the high priest, did not only have this garment and ephod with the stones in, in, and that it had the inscriptions of the children of Israel, he did not only have that, but God gave him a further commandment. And he basically said, as you're listening to these people that are failing, and as they confess their sins to you, I want you not to only bear it on the names of these stones, but I want you to put it on your heart. All the sins for a whole year long that the people confessed, the horrible things that were done, the defeats, the hurts, the pain, the wounds, the, the sins, the debauchery. I want you to carry them on your heart. I believe Aaron was pretty loaded down. And whenever he heard a sin or someone fall into sin, he felt it because he was to carry it on his heart. God asked him to carry all the sins of the children of Israel upon his heart. Let's look at it again. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. The word judgment means like a verdict. That is wrong, that is right. That is wrong, that is right. That's somewhat what a high priest was used for as well. A high priest was used also, well, well, Aaron, what do you think should I do here? Should I do this or should we do this? We have a family issue. Is this correct or is this wrong? That is often the way it was with the high priest stood in that order where he could give some answers. And when he goes in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually, for a memorial before the Lord continually, it is a bone, his heart, now look at the next verse, and thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment, the verdict of whether it was right or wrong, the Urim and the Tumen, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Now, you say that, well, just maybe once a year it'll be on his heart. No, 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 it's different. Aaron shall bear the judgment or the verdict of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Aaron had a responsibility to carry the weight of the sin of the people on his heart. And I'm sure that some of you have seen some of your children do some things that really grieved you. Or sometimes you find somebody, and I've dealt with this for so many years. I meet somebody from church. I meet somebody that might have an issue. Sometimes the issue is not known to me but I see it. And it rests, or not rest, but it lays on my heart. I can't sleep at night because of it. I roll around because it's continually on my heart. I stand as a person responsible somewhat. And I stand as an intercessor somewhat. As you stand in your family like that, 
You see some things that bother you. You see some things, some sins that are committed, that it's, it grieves you and you sense it, you feel it. It's continually on your heart. You can't get away from it. This is the responsibility of the high priest as he stood before the Lord and all year long until he stood before the Lord, he had this weight on him. And how do you think the weight was when, when he came out right having this responsibility put upon him and the next thing he knows, he himself, the high priest, had made a golden calf and was worshiping another god. And having to have that guilt on him, having let them perhaps into that kind of sin for a whole year now before I can go and make it right. I'll have to wait for a whole year and have that guilt and that, that ugliness upon my heart. And then when I walk in the presence of God, I'm not bringing him a happy birthday gift. I'm not bringing him a delightful gift, but I'm bringing him the debauchery of mankind. I'm bringing him the worst of the worst. And the stones that were so beautiful that the names were written on, I have to bring the dust and the dirt and the ashes of what those stones really mean. See, the high priest did not necessarily go in to the tabernacle once a year to bring good news to God. He came to deliver the bad news, to lay it there, and to walk out again to start a fresh year. I believe the high priest's job was a very ugly job. It was not a very nice job at all. It was not a wonderful calling in the eyes of man because it had to deal with the failures of mankind all the time. Man's continual failure and man's continual discouragement was all placed upon the heart of that little apron that he put in here called the ephod. And Aaron had to carry it all the time. I hope you're starting to see a picture here. Aaron must have walked with a heavy heart, a deep sense of responsibility. He bore the judgment of men and women's mistakes and sins upon his heart continually. He was also to wear a seamless rope, a rope that had no seams. Now, I want you to look at this. As you sit here today... If you couldn't have gone to God yourself with all the sins that you've committed 365 years, uh, days ago till now, and you would have had to confess them to me all the time when you failed, I would be standing here looking across this audience pretty grim. I would probably be looking at if I would have heard every sin you've confessed, every condition that you have been in, every discouragement that you have faced, every failure that you have made, and I'd be loaded down with that kind of idea or that kind of weight. I wonder if I'd be standing here with a smile on my face. I wonder if I'd be standing here with the joy of the Lord in my heart. That was where Aaron had to stand. But then God says, I know I'm loading you down as a high priest with a lot of problems, with a lot of struggles from people. And you know the details of their failure. But in that, I want you to wear something that will reflect who I am, not who you are. And in this, he commanded that the, there was a blue, deep blue, heavenly blue ephod, that these stones were placed on there. He also demanded that there was a purple, that there was purple in, in weaved into the garment, and that there were pomegranates, like red pomegranates, were hanging on the bottom of this robe with golden bells. And wherever he walked, there was a heavenly sound. Now, When you fail, do you hear the heavenly sound on the high priest? See, Aaron could have looked, walked around in a black robe because of all the sin and stains that he was holding from the people that will have to be dumped back in the Holy of Holies in a year, within a year. And he could have been a have a black rope that would indicate mourning, continual mourning. But God said, I don't want you to appear that way. 
Even though you have that, I want you to have a reflection of heaven upon you. I want you to see Jesus. I want the world and the people that are needing help and that have just confessed their sins upon your heart. I want them to see something heavenly in this. And when they see you, they won't think of a grim reaper. They'll think of something heavenly. Wherever you walk, I want that noise that, to bring courage to people. The sound of a bell, a bunch of little golden bells and pomegranates. And they will have a tingling sound that, you know, as soon as that high priest walks, it's like, ah. I'm sure it was one of the most beautiful things you could hear in that day. It, it indicated God's holiness. It indicates a servant at work. It indicates God's precious high priest. Well, on the head he had holiness unto the Lord. He had all kinds of garments. But the sound of it, even there was a certain step with this man that brought attention to God. Are you hearing me? Somehow God wanted the high priest to look very attractive for an ugly sinner to deliver a sin and the sins of the people upon his garments. But out of it shines heaven. Out of it you hear the joy and the sounds of praise even in his walk. I believe I have met people like that. I have met people in the spiritual priesthood, not high priesthood, but spiritual priesthood, that you could sense a heavenliness about them. You might have been pretty discouraged, but when you met them, you heard the bells and you heard the pomegranates that were putting out a noise. And when you walked away from them, you were so encouraged. Priests at work, high priests at work. Let's continue. Exodus chapter 28. Verse 35, And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he die not. You see, brothers, I know, and sisters, I have, down through the years, have learned to know a lot of your struggles. I believe most of you people that attend here regularly, I have heard struggles that you've shared with me. And I could have things about it if I would... The grace of God will never allow me to be down on that. I, if there's something about it that I find joy in Christ regardless of what happens. But if you look at this picture, God said, I want you to shine forth with the ropes, these heavenly ropes that I will have woven for you that has no seam, which indicates an eternal rope, has no beginning of day, no end of life. I want you to be roped with that heavenly rope, which we find later Jesus wore at, and it was parted. They parted the garment. It said it was a seamless rope. He wore the same one as what the high priest did. Now, what he wants us to know here is he says that I want you to shine forth the glorious light of heaven, the dress of heaven, lest you die. Some of you might have been going through some very difficult times, and today you might be down pretty far. You might have given up on God. You might have been pretty discouraged. God says, you're going to die in that condition. I want you to put on the heavenly robe. I want bells in your walk. I want pomegranates, pomegranates to talk in your life. I want to hear the sounds of heaven wherever you move. This is what he's saying about the high priest. Yes, high priest, I know. You could go back in the corner and say, I'm done with this work. All I ever hear is doom and gloom from the people. And will they ever stop sinning? No, I want you to dress yourself with a heavenly robe that heaven can be seen in you and heaven can be heard in you lest you die. You wear yourself, you dress yourself with the cares of this life and the failures of your life and the defeats and the discouragements, you will die. He says, no, 
I want you to have an undergarment on that reflects God's glory. And with all the problems you hear piling in from people, you have to have that so that you do not die. There's another way of saying you need to keep looking at the brighter side of life. Yeah, amen. The high priest. He had to continue to look at the brighter side of life. He couldn't allow himself to go down because of the failure of the people. There had to be that continual ring of his glory, of his holiness, of God's presence, because he represented God. Now, if you're really discouraged and things go wrong for you, you just feel like putting on a black mantle and go like this. You're going to die. He says, no, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to lift up your voice. I want you to put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. This will help you through life. There needs to be a continual tone of God's heaven, God's grace, God's mercy, and God's love that comes from your heart. You cannot restrict it regardless of what you go through. It will help save you. When I'm saying save, I'm not talking salvation. I'll read that verse again. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. Carrying that awful load of judgment upon his heart is near deadly. So there was a heavenly color and heavenly sounds wherever he walked, reflecting God's glory. It consoled the sorrowful, the wounded, and the sinful, and kept them alive. Have you ever meet somebody that's always down on everything? They don't have this rope. They don't have the bells. They're weighted down with other problems, and often problems of their own. God said, I will never put so many things on you that you cannot allow the bells that depict heaven's tones and the pomegranates. I will never put so much on you to keep that or so that you cannot reflect what God really is and what I'm bringing to the people. Yes, I know you have sinned. Yes, I know you have failed. Yes, I know there's misery. Yes, I know there's discouragement. But I, but I, but I am God. But I am God. And I will point you to my mercy and I will point you to my grace. Can you hear it? Can you hear it in the bell? Can you hear it in the pomegranate? Can you see it in the dress? Can you see the cheerfulness? Can you see the glory of my presence? God said, you take your sin to the prettiest dressed person in Israel. The one that was dressed with a special robe, the one that was dressed with an awesome robe, the one that had a seamless robe, the one that had the bright blue robe, the one that had the precious stones, the one that had the expensive stone, I want you to take your sin to him. It's a little bit of a different idea of what we see today. It's often as what priests are dressed in the Catholic churches is dressed in black, gloomy and doomy, and there you dump your sin. That's not what God wants. God says, I want there to be an attraction for your problem because I, I am your God. I am your God, and I don't deal with you because you are written on those stones. That's the big difference. Your name is written on those stones because you're precious to me. I think a lot of you, and I've made a provision for you to take your failure and throw it at my feet. I've made a full provision for that. It consoled the sorrowful, the wounded, the sinful, and it kept them alive. Hebrews 5.1, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. So, the reason and the purpose for a high priest was to offer gifts, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. The gift of forgiveness and the sacrifices of sin. That was the purpose of a high priest. Now, may I, again, make it very clear here. The purpose of a high priest was to take our failure to. 
God didn't see all the people failing so much that finally, well, we got to do something here. We just have to have a man then take care of your problems. No, he made the provision in case you do have a problem. He set the high priest in place so that I have a place to go to. Now, I want to transition a little bit from what I've been speaking about and go to the second part of the message. Have you noticed, and I have heard this, I've even heard it from the President of the United States, made this statement about all the killings that the Christians have done in the name of God, done through the years, the, uh, oh, down through the, uh, uh, what, what's the name of the, can't think of them, the Crusaders. The Crusaders, no, they weren't Christians. There's a big difference. There's been a lot of people killed in the name of God. I want you to know that. In the name of God, but it was in the Old Testament. And there was this huge transition that went from the Old Testament to the New when the Prince of Peace stepped out of heaven as a little baby. And he became a high priest for us, according to the Bible. Now, from that point on that he is our high priest, from that point on, we want to see something. All the killings have ceased. Those that follow the Word, those that follow what the Bible says, the New Testament says, the New Covenant, that has all ceased in the name of Jesus. All the killings and things that have happened before that was not the Jesus that God brought to us as a high priest. That was under the priesthood of other priests. But under the new priesthood, which is Jesus Christ, that has ceased, and he became the prince of peace. He introduced peace. Before it was eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It is not that way with this high priest. Now, there was many high priests, and there were failing high priests, but the one that was introduced to us to take our sins was not a failing man. He was actually better than that. He was the son of God himself. He had sonship. He had God within him. And he was a perfect lamb. He made no mistakes. He had no sin. He was no failure. He was the prince of peace. He was the king of kings. And he is lord of lords. That's my high priest. That's my high priest. Isaiah 42.1. Behold my servant whom I am behold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Now, this is in Isaiah. This is before Jesus was on the earth. Now we look to Isaiah 42, 5. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. When you look at this, this is said, what it says. He will not protest. He will not protest on the streets. He won't carry the signs and protest things. That's what it says. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. Look at verse 3. We're talking about the old wars between the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Egyptians and back and forth. There was all kinds of conflict. But when this high priest will come, he will come in a new way. He will not only dress like heaven, he will be heaven. And he will come to us, to our rescue. In verse 3 it says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. The word reed and flax, do you know what that used to be used? We have these little lanterns right down here. We have little wicks in them. And we have made, gotten manufactured wicks and what we do is we put oil, olive oil in those original 2,000 years old lamps right here. And we put oil in them and they burn at the wick. Back in those days, they didn't have wicks like we have. They had flax. They used flax, little flax stalks. And they used reeds. And when Jesus says, it says, when this high priest will come, he might not see the fire coming from the oil, but even the smoke, just a little smoke, he won't put it out. He will be a very tender high priest, one that will carefully deal with things, one that will be forgiving, one that will be eternal, 
one that will always be there for us. And when he sees a smoking flax, he won't blow on it, he won't put it out, he will just let it be because he knows that where there is smoke, there is fire. You see, some of you might have been down pretty much. Some of you, and at times you get so discouraged where you think there's almost no hope for you anymore. You're done, you messed up, you did something, and you're not in a condition right now that looks very heavenly. But the high priest that the Bible says that Jesus is, he, as long as he sees a little bit of smoke, he's not going to put you down. Or a broken reed. He's not going to just leave you sitting out there in the water because you're a reed. And you'll say, well, he's broken. He's no good. No. He will bring him in and stick you in the oil. You might not have those personal perfections right now. You might not have the great courage that you once carried. But this high priest is going to be a sensitive one. And he will watch. And he will carefully watch over you. And he will have an attraction where you can take your sins to him. And he'll carry the load. He'll carry it over his heart. We'll speak a little bit more of that, uh, more of that later. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have brought a verdict or judgment in the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law. The tenderness of our high priest. The other day I was, you know, I've been having my share of um, infirmities and things of this nature. I've, I've been dealing with a lot of heart, heart things. And uh, the other day, uh, two incidents that I'll never forget. The other day I was driving down the road, and uh, it was last Monday morning after last Sunday's message, and a beautiful bird. And my wife and I, we love the, the warblers. We do photography and we love warblers. And a bird came, and I don't think it was a warbler, but I'm not quite sure it was so quick, came and hit the hood of my pickup. And all I could see is it went back over the windshield and I had seen the mirror. I killed it. And the voice came to me and said that I permitted that. Oh. Yeah. Do you think that God today, the preciousness of the stones, the engraved of his children upon his heart, and he says that I even see the sparrow, and I, my permission goes with a falling sparrow? That sparrow, God saw it, and he saw the end is right there when it hit my hood, and he permitted it. God also said that I know how many hair that you have on your head. I am that interested in you that I have counted and I've taken a hair count of your head today. You are
yet without sin. This Jesus, that is the high priest now, he is my high priest. He's become a personal high priest. You know, back in that day, if I could see that, you know, my high priest is Eli. That's what Hannah said. I'm wanting a baby. I'm wanting a baby so bad. I'd love to just have a little baby. And, you know, I'm going to go up to the temple. I'm going to pray there in Shiloh. And I I'm just going to go there because... I boy. And so she dedicated the boy even before it was born or before it was conceived. And then Eli heard it and became a little critical and said, ah, oh, you're drunk. That was a faulty high priest. The high priest that I have, my personal high priest, and may I ask you to call him your personal high priest, your personal high priest doesn't make those faults. He doesn't look at me and misjudge me. He wears the judgment of me upon his shoulder. He does not misjudge me. He understands me. He knows me from the inside out. He doesn't mishear me. He doesn't misinterpret me. He knows everything about me. He even knows how many a hair I have on my head and even watches the sparrows that hit the, the hood of my truck. He knows every last detail. Why? Because I am precious to him. He is he thinks I'm so precious that he even counts my hair. And he has my name written on his heart, on the ephod. And we think, God, where are you? God, where are you? God, where are you? Do you even care about me anymore? God? God? My wife is precious to me. My children are precious to me. And my in-laws are precious to me. But I never counted their hair. But if they would be even more, 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 more precious, I'd even want to know if they lost any hair today. That's Jesus, my high priest. I'm wanting to tell you this morning that you have a high priest. His name is Yeshua. His name is Jesus. And his work is same as the other one, even it's perfect. There's only one thing different. He does, he's not here. He's somewhere else. Let's look. Where is this? Hallelujah. Math, Mark chapter 14, verse 62. And Jesus said, I am. And, he sh and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. Verse 63. Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need? We any further witness. The high priest sitting in front of Jesus now rents his clothes. Oh, do you know that Leviticus chapter 21, verse 10, it is a command that a high priest shall never tear his clothes. He is not to rent his clothes. But here he stands in front of Jesus and he tears his clothes. You know why? That was the last high priest, and there's never been another one since. Jesus now is the high priest, and he is fully clothed. It is not anything but ordered from heaven that the high priest sitting there in front of Jesus tears his robes off. He did it in anger, but God said, it is finished. There is no more of that priesthood that I'm looking for, but I'm looking for a heavenly priesthood, and that man is sitting in front of you, high priest. He is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek ordered all the way back from Abraham's time. Where the Holy Spirit said, I will make him a high priest. But the other high priest had to tear his clothes off, and he did. And remember, when I look at the high priest, Jesus, Yeshua today, I look at Yeshua as being my personal high priest. And when I come into his presence with problems and sins and defeats in my life, he is my personal high priest. I address him as my high priest. This morning when I got to my room, I said like this, I said, Jesus, my high priest. And I started talking to him. He is my personal high priest because I need one. God is not your high priest. Jesus is your high priest. 
What did he do? This high priest, where is he? Well, one thing that he did is after that, this other high priest tore his clothes. I believe it was Cephas. He tore his clothes off, his heavenly garbage tossed it, and now Jesus was immediately mantled as the high priest. So what happens after the resurrection and all that? Here he comes, and when he was at the cross and at the resurrection, or at the cross when he died, there was an entrance that used to be only occupied once a year where Cephas and all the other high priests could walk in. It was rent from the top to the bottom. And it was opened up completely so that my entrance can be into the King of kings and Lord of lords. And the next thing we know, he takes off and steps in a cloud and goes to heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God. That's my high priest. That's your high priest. Where is he? Is he in, in the next door neighborhood over here? Is he in another state? Is he in California? Is he in Africa? Is he in the desert? No, don't go after him. He is sitting at the right hand of the throne power of God. Amen. There is no higher calling, no higher place for my high priest to sit. And he sits next to the highest form of power there is. It's Jesus. There he is in full activity and full duty watching over me, carefully caring for me. He doesn't only dress heavenly, he is in heaven. And when I look, I look to heaven to speak to him. He is my high priest. There he sits. I had a, a girl a sister from church that contacted me and wanted to speak to me. And as she gave her life story, she, she sat there and there's just a lot of trouble that has come to her. And hard decisions and difficult decisions of this going wrong and seeing that this is God's way and then all at once the door seems to close. And it was just, there was time she sat there in some tears and and she was facing a big giant in her life. The place where she is living is a place where there was some evil uh, depictions of a picture in a room. And it bothered her because she has lived such a high standard of holiness and godliness. But when she comes to that dwelling where she's living, uh, there's some obstacles from posters and things like this that are sitting there, and yet she has no continuing city, doesn't really know where she belongs or where should you live. Would you come? I did not, this is the orange one, I did not tell them to come up here. I didn't give you a pre, um, didn't tell you beforehand that I'm going to use this testimony that you shared with me on text. Tell them what happened. Can you do that? Well, I went and met Wayne and Martha Tuesday evening and got home very late. Third, that was Tuesday evening. Wednesday evening when I got home, the poster that I had shared told them about was in the trash. but I actually got to burn that poster because it was in the trash. Wow. I just took it out with the rest of the garbage and burned it as well. Praise God. And then you knew that God is watching. That's right. And you had those questions. That's Amen. Right. And it was a big thing. It was a big thing. And she walked in the garage and there was this bad poster. And she asked, what should I do? Should I talk to him? brother, family, or what should I do? God hurt that. You didn't do a thing. God did it. You know why? A high priest was watching you. He was looking from heaven, and he heard that conversation. He knew all about it. He said, I'll deal with that. Amen? Thank you. Ruth. 
She has no idea why I want her up here. Maybe she does. So she hears the testimony how God healed my hay fever. And in her little quietness, God, I don't know that I don't have faith. I don't know how. But I need. And she asked the Lord, she asked the high priest, could you heal me like you did Wayne? Tell us what happened. I just heard about this this week. Um, it was about two years ago when we were on um, Sunday evening at our meetings over there. And he was telling us about his hay fever and how he dealt with it. Um, yeah, he had some issues with that. And I just really listened to him because I had the same problem. And when he said he got healed from his allergies, I Priest. That's who it was. Amen. Amen. In her innocence, Jesus, could you do the same thing? Could you heal me? And you've had it all your life. Is that right? Uh, 15 years. 15 years. But she's had this problem. I heard from people that have hay fever that this is a terrible year this year. It was, it was a terrible year. I've heard some people say that they have had hay fever where they've never had problems with it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, let's just look at this. Did she have perfect faith? Probably not. But she had the perfect high priest. Never forget that. A lot of us think that if I would have perfect faith, then everything would be perfect. Everything is perfect in the high priest. I want you to take that home with you. What an example of that. You didn't have, you didn't know how to have faith. You just, from that. yeah, far from that. But the high priest is perfect. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. One thing that I I always had to watch, you know, even mowing grass and weedy, um, moldy, hay, just, yeah, just even dust. And I'm doing all of that. It's just, it's unreal. <laughs> I don't think it's these. It's just unreal. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and then, Dan, your job, difficult. 
God, where are you? Where are you? Others of you that are going through difficult times, you wonder, where are you? Have I failed somewhere? That's what the high priest is for. And you have one personally. His name is Yeshua. He's at the right hand of the Father right now, sitting at the right hand of all power and all authority. There is where he is. It's not your perfection, it's his. It's not your failure, it's his perfection. I just, I just think you need to see this. You have a personal high priest if you have accepted him as your savior. If he is your savior, he is your high priest. He is waiting for you to ask him. And you are very precious to him. He knows more about you than any of you do. He knows more about me than anything I know about myself. I have no idea how many hair I have. He does. He knows every little detail about me that I do not know nor understand. Why? He's my personal high priest. He knows whether you're suffering or hurting or paining or struggling. He knows that. Just remember, he's your high priest. And a lot of, proud, a lot of times that we do not get relief from a high priest is because we don't believe that he is our high priest. We believe he has turned his back on us. We think he's turned the other way. We think he's not watching. But we are written on his, on these stones. And I have a little thing I have wrote here that I want to read off as I come to the close of this message. He built a bridge of faith to heaven and is seated with Almighty God at the right, of, uh, the right hand of the throne. The high priest sits where it all happens. He is positioned at the right of the throne. There is a throne in the heavens that is called the throne of grace. And if you are in trouble and if you need help, he asks us to come to the throne of what? Grace, because that's where he is. We are to come to the throne of grace. How many of you have asked the Lord in a difficult time and said, God, I need grace. I need mercy. I need grace. Our problem is we don't want to address him as a high priest. We sit back and we take the beating. Rather than coming to the high priest as my personal high priest and saying, I need grace. I come to your throne because there's grace there and I ask you to give me grace. Help me, Lord. And he will do so. Amen. He will do so. Jesus would not ask us to come to his throne called grace if he wouldn't have any. He knows he has grace. He knows he has plenty of it. We just need to have access to it, and we do, unless we turn our back, unless we get too discouraged, unless we look down too much, unless we have not enough heavenly bells hanging on us anymore. And it makes us go gloomy and doomy and the whole world stinks and everything is wrong and nothing pleases anymore. That's not our, our high priest. Our high, high priest is in heaven. He is seated. No more work to do. It's all done. It's finished. It's complete. He calls it the throne of grace. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. In time of when you have a need. How many of you have needs in your life? Where is the high priest asking you to come? He's asked you to come to him, the place of grace. He's asking you to come to his throne called grace. He has entitled his throne. I looked at the different things about his throne. It talks about the throne of power and a few words like that. But there's one specific word that is very clear that he, that he says it himself. And that is he calls his throne, a throne of grace. Our high priest sits on the right hand of the throne of grace. And there's all kinds of grace there. All kinds of grace. There's no lack of grace. So much grace that he calls it after that. And he asks you to come there boldly. God, I need grace in my life. I need mercy. I need help. I need something that I don't have right now. Can, you, can I have some? He says, come to me and ask. I will give you that. You see, when you're so low, you don't want to look up. You just want to look down. 
You don't want to face people. You want to run and hide. He says, no, no, no. You look up here and you come to me. You say like this, well, if he, if he is so much a, a, a high priest that looks out for every detail of me, knows my hair, why doesn't he just automatically help? It doesn't work that way. He, he tells you to come to that place and ask. You see, in, Christ, in our Christian experience, we have to come to him at times and say, God, I am in need of you. I cannot go my own anymore. I cannot keep myself up anymore. I cannot go higher anymore. I've, I'm, I've got too much pain. I've got too much hurt. I can't. And he's waiting for that. Lord, I cannot please you anymore. I need grace. No, we have this in us that I'm going to please God and make him smile on my life. Jesus says, no, that's what I'm about. I will do that for you. You come to me. Give me your hopelessness. And it's not based on your perfection. It's based on his. Do you hear me? Yeah. Amen. Our high priest, my high priest, if the uh, musicians would come up, the singers, we're about ready to close. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of what? Need. And when you have a time of need, you're needy. You feel it. It's all over you. You're needy. Amen. Hebrews 13, 10. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Ah, back in the old tabernacle, there was an altar that the high priest worked and they, they couldn't eat any of the food, nothing like that. We may eat. It says, whereof they have, they, the ones that were under the law, had no right to eat, which served the tabernacle. But that's not the altar that we are. We are the altar where we can, we can come to and we can eat. Then in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10, uh, uh, Hebrews 5, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, that, this is my high priest, your high priest, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying, and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was hurt in that he feared. He knows exactly what I have gone through because he went through it first. He knows every detail. He knows how to sympathize. He knows how to feel about it. He knows how I feel about it. He knows how you feel about it. He knows all those details. He did it and there's times when he had strong crying because it hurt him so bad. That's what it says in Hebrews 5. I'll read it again. Verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, Jesus cried and he had tears running over his cheeks. He was in desperate times like that. He knows exactly when we have that. He knows what it feels like. He bears sympathy with us. He knows what to do about it. And he's there and he's watching. You see a poster, a bad poster on a wall, and you don't know how to approach it, but he sees your heart because he's watching. He'll remove that for you. And the healing part, people that are needing healing don't have the right or correct or perfect faith. He just needs to see that, that heart that is open. And God, please, I come to you humbly. Can you do this for me? You might not have the perfect faith. Why? Because you have a perfect high priest. There's a huge difference. We want to perfect ourselves in faith rather than our relationship with the high priest. And that's what matters. Most people that are discouraged or have given up on God have dislocated their own connection with God, the high priest. And don't address him as the high priest, the one that looks over your life, the one that is there to help you, the one that is there to give you grace. But we'd rather just sob and go in a corner somewhere and wish we wouldn't see anybody. That's how it works when a person is hurt. And we all get hurt. I get hurt. And I feel just like that. But then God out of heaven speaks and says, Come to me. Come. I am your high priest. Speak to me. I need your voice. I need you to connect with me. And I will bless you. I will give you grace. See, our dependence is constantly on him. Verse 8, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things he suffered. Jesus had to suffer through these things to learn obedience. 
You see, sometimes we think like this, when will I ever learn this so I don't ever stumble again? You will never learn it. You'll suffer. You will not learn this this way. You will learn obedience through things you suffer. This is why we suffer at times. This is why we hurt sometimes. This is why we pain sometimes. Because we're learning obedience. And I believe that one great obedience is to keep in connection with the high priest. I wonder if I would bring this high priest in our midst that you have as a person. Say, for instance, I'll just pick one of you out, and I'll say, this is your high priest, and I'll bring him in here, and he sits here every Sunday. I wonder if you ever connect with him. If we'd all have a different high priest, would you know him? Would, would you know, would he hear from you? My personal high priest is someone that I need to hear from, and he needs to hear from me. But we allow ourselves to be dislocated from him because we feel guilty. That's what he's for. When did the children of Israel come to the high priest? They came with what? Sins. They came with their worst condition. They came with their defeats. That's what a high priest is for. There's another prince of the power of the air that wants to interfere with us in this communication, in this relationship. And it will try to tell us that you should have nothing but good to offer to him. And you're not good enough for him. All the defeats and things that you have done, you should never even ask him for forgiveness. You don't deserve it. That's correct, we don't deserve it. But that's not my high priest. It's not based on what I deserve. It's based on what he paid for. He paid for my sins. He paid for my issues. And he is asking me to come to him. And if I neglect that, I'm neglecting salvation. I'm neglecting the provision. Come to the throne of grace. He knows my name. He knows everything. He knows your name. He knows how many hair are on those heads. He knows everything. He knows your name. Don't think he doesn't. He knew Christy's name. Christy went home that night. That was a big issue for her. It was a big Budweiser poster in her home. And the Budweiser poster normally, if, if I recall anything about Budweiser posters, there's normally not, not a very pretty picture or a very godly picture on it. I have no idea what was on there, but it was that. And it was a very big obstacle in my Christian, where I come home, when I want a little place of safety, a little place of peace. And I walk right into that thing every night I come home and God heard it. Why? Because there's a high priest in the heavenlies. And he saw that. He saw the desire of the pure girl. And he said, granted, the desire of this lady that needs to be healed from hay fever that's had for 15 years. She didn't say it the perfect way. She didn't know it the perfect way. She just knew the perfect high priest. He's, he's after the order of Melchizedek. Nobody can ever undo him. He will always be a high priest. You cannot undo him. You cannot hurt him. You cannot keep him from his work. You can do nothing like that. He is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he will be reigning eternally. He will never stop. You will never offend him. You will never push him away. He will always be there for you. You might as well use him as your savior on a daily basis. But if you give up, if you give up on him, he can't do anything for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience to the things he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Verse 10, the next verse. Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. God called him to be your high priest. May I, may I say this? Use him. Use him. Come to him. Speak to him. If you need forgiveness, go to him. Don't carry it around. Don't pull a train load of sin. Many people have their cars loaded down with all kinds of evil and filth. 
Deliver it to him if you have issues. Our high priest has not laid aside the breastplate which our, na which our names are graved on, nor the precious two onyx stones encased in gold which you wore upon his shoulders. Upon his heart and his shoulders our exalted high priest bears all his people. His heart and arms are both betrothed to them. His love and his power are immersed by them as he sits at the right hand of God. He loves you with an eternal love that he cannot get away from. He has paid the price. He has an endearment about you. And he knows he's a spouse to you. That's my engaged wife. I'm engaged to that beautiful woman. And if I see her with a hair missing, if I see her with a problem, I see her with an issue, I will come to that rescue. That's why I'm sitting here. But unless you come to me, I, I cannot reach out. You're down there. Reach for help. I am the throne of grace. You're not the throne of grace. I'm a spouse to you. I'm going to marry that woman. That woman is pure, but give your sins to me. I can't forgive them until you confess them. The high priest, the high priest, my high priest, my personal high priest sits at the right hand of power, the right hand of God. If you are low in spirit, faint and downcast, or even at the point of despair, approach the Lord Jesus at the throne of all rule and of all grace. Never be afraid of our high priest. I'm just reading some of my notes. Never be afraid of our high priest, which is full of compassion and grace. Because he remembers and knows very well the day that he said, with all that he had, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He knows that forsaken feeling. He knows what it feels if God would turn his head. He knows that feeling. He knows your name. When you come to him, there is one final instruction. You must believe that he is a rewarder of them that seek him. I know the translation puts diligently, but the original does not have that. He is a rewarder of them that seek him. So when I come to my high priest, I know he's going to hear me. And I must believe that. I'm not speaking to a balloon. I'm not speaking to an airhead, if I may say that. I'm not speaking to a, an idol God sitting somewhere out on a piece of wood. I'm not speaking to a carved piece of wood that looks like an animal. I'm speaking to one that can hear me, one that is fully alive, one that operates next to the throne of all power. He is a rewarder, and he knows when I call on him. He wants to hear. He wants from my heart to know that I trust him. If you're asking for me to spend some time with you and sit down and counsel, and I already know that you do not trust me about anything, I don't want to meet with you. But when I know that you're willing to hear and listen to what I have to say, I'll have something for you. I believe God's the same way. Jesus is the same way. No preconceived ideas come into his presence. No hurts too big. No defeats too big. No sins too big. No backslider too big. Nobody wounded too long. Nobody that is hopeless and given up for so long. No, none of those are excluded from the presence of this great high priest. Because upon his shoulders, there's a strap. And that strap has that breastplate on. And that breastplate... We have a breastplate of righteousness, but he has a breastplate and has our name on it. That was the high priest in the Old Testament. I believe the New Testament so much has more of that. We are a breastplate. We are part of that breastplate for him. It's glorious. It's a glorious picture. And when we come to Jesus, it's all about heaven because that's where we look. It's not just blue colors. It is heaven. It's not heaven like blue. It is heaven. It is not a picture like the throne. It is the throne. We're access. We have access right to the most powerful place on all of the universe. If I just make contact. That's where my high priest is sitting. He has paid the full price. He has paid for every sin 
that needs to be uh, forgiven. He has taken everything upon him, and our names are written there. And when we come to him, the names match. Wayne, it's right here. And he bears it on our heart. I believe that's what he had on his heart when he went to the cross, when he came and resurrected from the dead, when he went up and ascended into heaven. I believe the name was taken right with him. We are written in his registry. The Bible is very clear about that. When the book of life is opened and our name is found in there, that book of life or that fountain of life could be the very heart of Jesus, my high priest. And when you come to him, some years ago I was down in Miami and I had a reservation to come to a certain place for a certain seminar. And when I came up to the desk, they did not have a name that matched anything and I could not get in. And it was a mistake. Later on found out that my name was there and once they saw my name, then my name was welcome in. The high priest that I know that represents me, that I believe in, that is my personal high priest, has my name on his breastplate. And it's engraved in the most precious stones. There it is. And when I make contact, it's like, yes, you're registered here already. Have you been pre-registered through the new birth? And if you are, are you using your access? There is no PIN number. It's called being born again. Can you use what God has provided for you in Christ? I would like for you all to say this with me. I'll say it first. Jesus is my high priest. I just want you to confess that. If you're born again, say that right now. Jesus is my high priest. After the order of Melchizedek, he will never stop. Eternity. He is an eternal one. The other one tore his clothes off and they went and separated the, the garment. So they can never put it together again. There is no other high priest anymore. Jesus, the last high priest, the only high priest, and he lives forever. And he's my high priest. And he calls me his friend. I hope you find him that way. He knows your name. He knows your name. Amen. The stars are one and all. He knows how much sand is on the shore. He sees every sparrow that falls. He made the mountains and the seas. He's in control of everything. And of all creatures, great and small. He knows my name. See you.